The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 15410 in the name of Emma Harper on World Cancer Day 2019. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Emma Harper to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to be leading this debate today, noting that yesterday, February the 4th, 2019, marked World Cancer Day. And I'd like to thank my colleagues who supported my motion and I'm looking forward to everybody's contribution. I'd like to thank Cancer Research UK for their media support in both print and social media in the last week, as well as ITV Border in my own South Scotland region for their coverage of my sister's primary breast cancer treatment and recovery journey. Raising awareness was the whole purpose. Cancer is a global subject, possibly too big to cover in the time allocated. And my previous career as an operating room nurse meant I assisted in tumour removal and tissue repair daily. One in two people get cancer in their lifetime, but over the last 40 years, survival rates have doubled and half the people diagnosed are now surviving cancer thanks to the great progress made in cancer research. The theme for this year's World Cancer Day is unity, and I'm wearing my unity band today because we must unite to beat cancer. No single person, organisation or country is going to beat cancer alone. We must all unite and work together to make faster progress on achieving the goal of three out of four people surviving cancer by 2034. As Cancer Research UK have outlined, four in 10 cancers could be prevented by actions like not smoking, keeping a healthy body weight, cutting back alcohol, eating a healthy balanced diet and keeping active as well as enjoying the sun safely. And I say that as somebody who needs a factor at least 50 when she goes to the sun. We need to raise awareness of the reduced uptake of cervical cancer screening in Scotland, and this was debated recently here also. It's nearly, it's actually really important that women accept their NHS invitation to attend the cervical screening. Research is being conducted in Dufries and Galloway for a simple home self-test for cervical screening for HPV, that's human papillomavirus, which is the cause of 99.7% of cervical cancers. There are 6,000 women in NHS Dumfries and Galloway Health Board area alone who have not taken up their cervical screening invitation, and I'd like to encourage them all to do so. This, therefore, highlights the importance of research, research to make screening easier, less uncomfortable, more accessible, and easier to engage with. Again, when cancer is detected early, treatment is more successful. Presiding officer, one area I would like to highlight is smoking. And as convener of the cross-party group on lung health, and with a sister who's a respiratory nurse consultant, I'm keen to support any activity we can implement to help people quit smoking. Cancer Research UK provided a briefing ahead of this debate, which I thank them for. And according to the briefing, smoking is the biggest preventable cause of cancer and is linked to 15 cancer types. Unfortunately, smoking prevalence is still close to 40% in some groups in Scotland, and it is a greater cause of health inequality than social position. It is responsible for half the difference in life expectancy between those from the most and least deprived backgrounds. Smoking cessation services are an extremely important tool in reducing smoking prevalence. NHS Stop Smoking Services are successful in reaching people from communities where we see a lower success rate for quitting smoking. My mum was a smoker for 40 years and she's been able to stop with the help from local NHS Stop Smoking Service and she's achieved non-smoking status for the past 10 years and that's fantastic. Cancer Research UK is calling on the Scottish Government to ensure local and national levels of investment in Quit Your Way services so that they are maintained for the duration of Scotland's five-year tobacco control strategy. And I echo these calls. Providing, presiding officer, last year, the Scottish Government published a healthier future backed by £42 million of investment with the aim of improving the health of people of Scotland. It has a particular focus on obesity, which is the second biggest cause of cancer next to smoking in Scotland. Obesity is linked to 13 types of cancer, such as breast and bowel, and some of the hardest to treat, such as pancreatic and esophageal. 
Pancreatic cancer is particularly difficult to diagnose, and I recognise my colleague Claire Adams Adamson's continued effort to highlight pancreatic cancer, and I'm sure that she will expand more on this in her contribution. It is interesting to note that only one in four Scots know that being overweight could put them at risk of cancer. That's particularly concerning when we consider that Scotland's level of obesity is among the highest in the UK and we're among the heaviest nations in Europe. I was therefore pleased to see the Scottish Government publish the Healthier Future Plan, which sets out 67 action points, including reducing excessive junk food consumption, improving the health of our young people and providing better and easier access to healthier food for families on a low income, all of which are extremely welcome steps. Additionally, the plan calls on the UK government to bring a change to broadcasting laws to restrict the promotion of certain foods and TV, which I would ask the Scottish government to continue to push the UK government to do as soon as possible. Presiding officer, last week, I, along with other members in the chamber, had the privilege of taking part in a photo for the organisation Make Seconds Count. And I was pleased to meet Lisa Fleming, the founder of the group. Make Seconds Count is a charity here in Edinburgh created to raise funds to support women and men, of course, with secondary breast cancer. Additionally, one of their principal aims is to raise awareness of secondary breast cancer, as one woman described how she felt discarded. She says, we want to count too. We need to be part of research and funding. I wouldn't be here today without being part of a Pergetta trial. All of the funds raised by Make Seconds Count go to re the research team at MRC Institute of Genetics and Molecular Medicine at the University of Edinburgh. Presiding officer, while I don't have time to mention all of the organisations which are carrying out important work with cancer patients and their families, I would like to recognise some in my South Scotland region where in Dumfries and Galloway alone we have 1,130 people living with cancer and 530 cancer deaths each year. D&G has a cancer information and support centre, a joint venture between Macmillan Cancer Support and Big Lottery Fund and NHS Dumfries and Galloway. It offers confidential counselling and support information on living with cancer and treatment, complementary therapies, stress management and relaxation tips, as well as links to local support groups where persons can come together to share their experiences and even just have a bit of company. We also have Ayrshire Hospice based in Ayr. The hospice helps adults in Ayrshire and Arran with life limiting illnesses such as cancer and other neurological conditions. I'd like to thank the many organisations made up of extremely hardworking volunteers and staff who are working tirelessly together to support anyone affected by cancer. In conclusion, presiding officer, no single person, organisation or country is going to beat cancer on its own. We must all work together to make faster progress on our goal of three out of four people surviving cancer by 2034. Once again, this year's World Cancer Day theme is unity, uniting people, communities, researchers and governments to raise awareness and take action. We must unite in the fight against cancer. Thank you. Can I remind any member who wishes to speak in this debate to have a wee check and make sure that their buttons have been pressed because I seem to have a very low uptake here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Joan McAlpin. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And um, can I start by thanking um, Emma Harper for bringing this debate forward today and thank all the organisations um, who have provided briefings for today's debate. Um, personally, I think it's been lovely and uplifting to read about um, Emma's sister's story, Buffy, and um, she's outlined that uh, today already. But I think it's important that as we see these campaigns go forward, that um, the human side to these stories are often what are so vital, and in doing so, to encourage our fellow Scots to buy unity bands and help raise funds for clinical research. 
Um, there can't be many people in this chamber who have not been touched by cancer or have a cancer story themselves. Um, my own I shared in my maiden speech when I said um, that I had lost my mother to breast cancer when I was seven. So World Cancer Day, I think, is an opportunity for all of us uh, to recommit ourselves and our country to working to try to tackle cancer and make sure people with cancer can live as long and good lives as possible. Yesterday, as, um, as part of a visit for World Cancer Day, I visited the Maggie's Cancer Centre um, here in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Cancer Centre along uh, with the Public Health Minister. And I'd like to pay tribute to all the charities and volunteers um, from across Scotland who work to support people and their families as they go through a cancer journey. Um, we're all wearing our unity bands today and I want to start by paying tribute to everyone who's helped fundraise in whatever way they have um, to help support the work of cancer charities in delivering care, vital care and also research. Yesterday I met with um, a constituent from Livingston who was about to start a five-week treatment for bowel cancer and she highlighted to me a number of key points which I thought were important for this debate and which I said I would raise during the debate. Um, because it's often when you're going through cancer treatment in Scotland with our fantastic cancer centres, some of the challenges around that which um, actually struck me with conversations and it wasn't necessarily the treatment or anything, it was around transport and aspects of that. And one of the things which struck me was the changes in our demographics in Scotland today is that actually a number of adults do not have children and a larger percentage of people in Scotland are actually living on their own. And often when people commence their cancer treatment, they're told that someone um, will need to drive them or someone will be helping them with tasks or someone uh, will be there when they get home or be supporting them. And, you know, the message she really gave me loud and clearly was that for her, that someone just didn't exist. So how we can help patients and develop a truly holistic approach for people living with cancer and actually understanding what they're going through in their treatment is important. And an area I think which can be improved and in Scotland we've been world leading with the development of Maggie's um, and other charities in this field but it's something I think we need to look towards. And especially as an, an ask really minister from this is the, the cancer patient survey I think has provided a great opportunity um, for us to actually learn and hear the people's experiences. So I hope we'll make sure that's uh, fully funded going forward uh, for future uh, surveys as well. As has already been said, in terms of um, breast cancer, last week I also um, was delighted to meet with the remarkable ladies from Make Seconds Count, a number of which I've been campaigning with in other campaigns. You know, the fact that these ladies campaign with um, such... Um, guts and strength with everything that they're going through anyway is just remarkable but I know from those who I've campaigned with alongside the Progetta campaign and um, breast secondary secondary breast cancer is still very much um, a forgotten form of breast cancer and something which needs to be talked about as we look towards how we can improve research this is despite only five to nine percent of national funding for breast cancer research going to secondary breast cancer and I think that really does have to change um, there is good news around breast cancer. I don't want to, um, to put that in any question at all because when you look at statistics, the mortality rate has improved so dramatically over the last few decades. In Scotland, we now see it 32.5% per 100,000 people in 2017 compared to a mortality rate of 53.5% in 1992. So as a nation, we have made real progress. Could you start to wind up? Please? Yes, absolutely. In terms of... Um, my final points on this, as World Cancer um, Day has presented us with an opportunity, I think, yes, to look at uh, what's happening in Scotland, but globally. I recently attended a conference in Oxford when I met with some Syrian cancer specialists. They told me about the tragedy of what's happened in their country and the loss of all their national health services there and how it's diminished uh, their whole opportunity uh, to treat patients. What they hoped for on a day-to-day -day basis was just to have access to electricity. How we make sure that we tackle some of these issues globally are so important. One of the facts they gave me was the number of people in the world uh, with cancer who have no pain relief whatsoever. I place. think that's something we on World Cancer Day should consider and look to how we collectively can look to address. Thank you. I know I forgot to say four minute speeches, so I'll say it now. Four minute speeches, please. Got a lot to get through. John McAlpine, followed by Neil Finlay. 
Uh, thank you very much. I too would like to congratulate Emma Harper for securing this debate on World Cancer Day. And I'd like to pay tribute to Emma's sister Buffy for her fight against breast cancer. Anyone who knows Buffy can't fail to be impressed by how her outgoing personality and her optimism, and we're all really pleased um, with her recovery. Um, I wanted to speak today in this debate um, partly in tribute to Buffy and also to the hundreds and thousands of people affected by cancer. Cancer Research UK and Emma today have pointed out that survival rates have improved significantly in the last two decades and that's in no small part due to the work of Cancer Research UK and a lot of that work is going on here in Scotland in our world leading universities. And this month I've decided to support that work uh, by signing up to Cancer Research UK's campaign Sugar Free February. It aims to help beat cancer and beat cravings too. Uh, I have a hopelessly sweet tooth, uh, but I have to say it hasn't taken long before I have stopped missing chocolate cakes, even white wine, uh, which is full of sugar. Uh, and of course, we know that being overweight, as Emma has said, can increase the risk of getting a range of cancer. So going sugar free sends a really important message there. Uh, I would predicate that by saying I've known many fit, slim, healthy people um, who, who lead uh, impeccable lifestyles who get cancer too. So um, it Cancer can be illogical and it can be unfair. And again, that's why we need more research. As for my sugar-free fundraising, I've raised, I have raised £160 so far. And if I could convert a few of those pounds sterling raised into pounds and stones lost, I will be a very happy woman. And here's my pitch. I know there might be quite a few people in the chamber who would appreciate seeing less of me, not least my political opponents. So now you really can achieve that by heading for my cancer research giving page on Facebook and Twitter uh, after that shameless pitch. Um, this is a day to remember that many people survive cancer, of course, and those survival rates, as we've heard, have, are improving all the time. But there are still huge challenges, and I wanted to finish by talking about my most recent experience of cancer, um, which I think illustrates an issue that we need to talk about more, which is cancer in older people. Uh, my father, Jim, died of an unspecified cancer, um, aged 83. He was very fit. He was a very healthy man. He never sat down. He was also a carer. He contributed to his community, his church. And like many older people, he spent his retirement making a difference to his family and the people around him. Uh, now, I know we were very lucky to have him so long. And I've heard Miles Briggs talk about losing his own mother as a child. And many people who have lost loved ones much earlier will probably wish that they had their mum or dad as long as I had my dad. Um, but cancer in older people can be devastating. It's not true that it always progresses more slowly and that wasn't the case in my dad's illness. He was dead within a few weeks of his diagnosis and he suffered very greatly. Um, and this affects a lot of people. The number of people over 75 diagnosed with cancer is expected to rise by 80% in the next 20 years. And, and, and the majority of cancer patients at the moment are over 65. So understanding the differences in how cancer develops and behaves in older people is a very urgent issue for researchers. And I was very pleased uh, to see the briefing um, from Cancer Research UK from last year, advancing care, advancing years, improving cancer treatment and care for an aging population. Um, older people respond in different ways, both to chemotherapy and to pain relief. But if there isn't an understanding of this, um, we, we can't treat them um, effectively. Um, despite the prevalence of cancer in the elderly, treatment studies rarely include people older than 70. And this means that doctors don't have clear guidance on what works best for older patients. Uh, to quote one geriatrician, in geriatrics, we're always having to extrapolate from treatment guidelines based on younger people, but the gap is most, most extreme in cancer care. And as our population ages, this is no longer acceptable. Older people uh, live worthwhile lives, like my father, they're often the linchpins of their communities as volunteers and as cancer carers. So I'm very pleased that progress has been made and that this issue is being recognized. And I hope in the next, uh, the next 20 years that we see advances in cancer care for everybody who suffers from this disease, no matter what age they are. Thank you very much. Neil Finlay, followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, thanks, President Officer, and thank Emma Harper for bringing the debate forward. Um, uh, we uh, all have a friend, a relative, a wife, partner, child, or child affected by cancer. Uh, on the face of it, the disease doesn't discriminate. It impacts on people, be they black, white, young, 
old, male or female. But this is a day, of course, for telling our stories because that's the way in which we understand and we empathise with people who are affected. <coughs> Excuse me. Cancer can be a brutal, uncompromising thing. My, my own dad was a, a big bearer of a man who worked as a bricklayer all his life. Uh, it took him 15 years ago at the age of 64. He was reduced to a shell of his former self uh, as the disease worked its way through his body. And I miss him every day. And like too many people in communities like mine, his life was cut short well before his time because of this disease. <coughs> but the experience, in, experience of dealing with cancer can also be life-affirming and uh, very uplifting. When my wife Fiona was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer three years ago, and she's wearing my unity band today, uh, I feared the worst. I, wonder if, I wondered if my dad's experience would be repeated uh, with her. But I thank every day the NHS staff, our family, friends, colleagues, every God that exists, and most importantly her for that not happening, and that today she's back to full fitness and well. But she was lucky, but she was also fantastically and skillfully looked after by Dr. Barber, Nurse Laura, and the entire team at the St. John's Oncology Unit and the Western General uh, Radiotherapy Unit. Whilst the experience of my dad and other relatives, friends, neighbours and constituents uh, has often been grim and brutal and life-ending, for others it can be life-changing for very positive reasons. Presiding officer, contrast this <coughs> following the tears and emotion of my wife's diagnosis. Within a few days, our house was full of cards and flowers and visitors and people offering their help and support. But we couldn't help reflect on how fortunate we were. How many people are there in all of the communities we represent who get a cancer diagnosis, maybe a terminal diagnosis, and they return to a cold, empty house with no cards, no flowers, and barely see a visitor or get an offer of any help or support? Think of the feeling of being told you have cancer and have no one to talk to about it. No one to share your fears or tears. No one to go with you to hospital or make you a cup of tea or sit with you during chemo or take you on the 26 miles to the Western General every day for radiotherapy. Trying to imagine that brutal loneliness haunts me every time I think about it, I have to say. So my ambition, I think like that of all of us here uh, on this week of World Cancer Day, is of course that we find a cure but that we improve prevention, especially in the most deprived communities, where the mortality rate in Scotland is scandalous. It's absolutely scandalous. 60 to 70% higher. Uh, that is where cancer does discriminate in communities like where I live. I want us to get a grip on waiting times. And I want us to show that addressing a disease that will affect one in two of our population over their lifetime is really and genuinely and truly a national priority. <coughs> Alison Johnson, followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, presiding officer. I'll start by declaring that I'm currently enjoying my third sugar-free February, um, and I am finding it easier this year. Um, and it's already the 5th of February. <laughs> Um, Presiding Officer, World Cancer Day is it's not the only time we can reflect on what we can do better to help reduce the incidence of cancer, survival rates and the quality of cancer care, but it is a really important opportunity to step back and to take stock, to reflect on how far we've come, but on how much more we have to do. Um, and I too would like to thank Emma Harper for giving the Chamber that opportunity today and to thank Buffy too for her inspiration. As the motion notes, 40% of cancers are preventable and being more physically active can play an important role in reducing cancer risk. Physical exercise we know helps tackle obesity, the second biggest risk factor. But evidence shows that being more active can help reduce cancer risk through other mechanisms too, such as by improving our digestive function, which can reduce cancer, colon cancer risk. There's approximately a 30% lower risk of colon cancer and 20% lower risk of breast cancer associated with being active every day. And active travel and cycling in particular is associated with reduced risk of cancer. 
a 2017 study from Glasgow University looked at the impact of travelling to work by bike and on foot and found that commuting by bike, even partially, was associated with a lower risk of adverse health outcomes, including several cancers. So physical act activity is really important for people who are waiting, who are having or recovering from treatment, who are waiting on treatment. Exercising while undergoing cancer treatment, for example, can help prevent decline in physical function and control cancer-related fatigue. So we have to do all that we can to make sure that that activity is available for everyone. And the Scottish Health Survey shows that 65% of adults meet the, the guidelines for moderate or vis vigorous physical activity, but this falls to 56% in our most deprived communities. And members will have heard me talk about investment in active travel before, and I will raise it here again. So many car journeys in Scotland are short and they could be undertaken by foot or on bike. 33% are between one and two miles, 11% are under a mile. So let's promote walking and cycling. Um, because in doing so, we reduce risks of cancer. The motion rightly calls attention to the doubling of cancer survival rates over the past 40 years. But as Neil Finlay um, pointed out, an individual's chances of getting and surviving cancer are still very much influenced by their socio-economic situation. Cancer incidence is more common in the most deprived areas of Scotland. Incidence rates have been typically 30 to 50% higher in the most deprived areas compared to the least deprived. And Macmillan, an NHS National Services report, Deprivation and Cancer Survival in Scotland, found that mortality from cancer is highest amongst those from the 20% most deprived communities, <coughs> and that the dif difference was statistically significant for eight cancers, including breast, liver, and lung cancer. So as the motion notes, early detention is one of the keys to successful treatment we're still not doing enough to ensure that Scots experiencing deprivation are accessing screening programmes, and I'd be grateful if the Minister could comment on that in closing. Um, we have heard, you know, I, I too would like to thank the incredible campaigners from Make Seconds Count. I think their visit last week has had an impact on each and every one of us. I'd like to thank all those who work with the 50% of us who have cancer. Um, my mum was diagnosed with myeloma in a blood cancer in 2014. She's had a a stem cell transplant and is currently having her, a, a three monthly check with haematology. But she in particular has been very, very grateful to two Macmillan nurses who are based in Wester Hills Healthy Living Centre. Um, and you know, she's spoken of the fact that it's not just health support, it's support on so many areas from nutrition to exercise, to entitlements, to transport, to, to support getting a blue badge. Absolutely everything is covered and I think um, you know, I, my, my thanks to all of those who are involved helping those with this disease. Um, to close, presiding officer, World Cancer Day is a time to reflect on the huge progress we have made learning about a disease that will impact about 50% of Scots. And I look forward to hearing more from the Minister in closing about how we can tackle it together. Thank you. Before I call Mr McMillan, I know that, that this particular debate is one that people want to say a lot in and I do have a lot of members still wishing to speak. So um, I'm happy to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. And I would ask Ms Harper to move the motion. I move the motion. Thank you. The uh, question is that under Rule 8.14.3 the debate is extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Yeah, oh, thank you. I was worried for a minute there. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. The debate is therefore extended. And I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Uh, thank you very much, Planning Officer. First of all, Planning Officer, I'd like to congratulate my friend and colleague Emma Harper for securing this important and also timely debate. The motion itself is succinct, uh, and Emma Harper laid out uh, further uh, background in her opening speech. I'm not going to stand here and profess that I'm an expert in the field of cancer, as I'm clearly not. However, cancer knocks on the door of many families and households indiscriminately. The motion talks about one in two people will get cancer in their lifetime, and that may appear to be a high stat, but uh, I'm not aware of many families who actually haven't been affected by cancer. And survival rates uh, increasing is something that firstly, we will all welcome, but secondly, recognize that this hasn't happened by chance or overnight. This is where the research is so important and the investment to fund that research is crucial. We have received various briefing notes prior to today and, uh, and I want to thank all the organisations uh, that work and also help in the, the cancer field. 
The figures they highlight about research provide an indication as to how much actually has been, but is also spent. But also still that journey that we still have to, to go on to actually beat cancer. With Cancer Research UK spending £38 million alone last year, and breast cancer now spending just over £16 million, it's clear that the sector is working hard. Now, I want to thank everyone involved in cancer research. And I also want to thank everyone who works with patients to provide them with the expert care, the attention and information that they require every single day. Every year, MSPs don a, a bit of pink to highlight the Wear It Pink Day to both you know, raise awareness of and also raise funds about breast cancer. I must admit, we do look a bit ridiculous at times, uh, but it's for a good cause. Now, my constituents uh, see the funny side of it when the, when the photo appears, uh, apart, all apart from one, that is. Now, all appreciate the, the fun element uh, highlighting the serious, serious message. In my constituency, I've got dealings with Marie Curie and also Macmillan, and I appreciate everything that they do to help make the lives of my constituents better and also more comfortable. I take a, a slightly cold position on cancer, and uh, I tend to approach it in a state of defiance. Uh, sometimes I might mean that uh, I might possibly not show enough emotion uh, when I talk about it or, or actually work with others uh, on the issue. But that genuinely is my self-defense mechanism. On the issue, uh, I need to try to remain as impersonal as possible. Now, I know and I've known too many people with cancer. Some have managed to beat it and others haven't. And I so admire and cherish those that have survived and continue with their lives, usually with a, a different perspective. And one final point I want to raise, presenting also, is the, the issue of the media and TV programmes. That's uh, Emma and Harper that spoke about TV earlier on. They play a, a hugely important role in portraying a message. At the moment, there's a programme on STV, Cold Feet. Uh, they, one of their characters, Jenny, played by the wonderful Fay Ripley, uh, is, uh, is playing that character and someone who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. Now, I've not seen last night's episode yet, but uh, I'll see it later on in the week. But the connection that the characters have actually got with the audience is testimony to both the excellent writing, but also the acting. However, the storyline is extremely powerful, but highlights both the importance of talking about breast cancer, the early diagnosis of cancer, the treatment that's required, but also the mental challenge of facing up to and dealing with it. This is where the media have got such a, a, an important part to play. Now, I want to thank the programme makers for introducing this storyline so carefully, but also so sensitively. Now, presenting us yesterday was World Cancer Day, but Cancer Day starts for someone new every single day. Now, I do thank Emma Harper once again for securing this debate, and I want to once again thank everyone working in the field for their efforts uh, to both improve the research, but also the treatment of people with cancer. Now, one day, one day society will defeat this awful indiscriminate disease forever. Thank you. Mark MacDonald, followed by Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I congratulate Emma Harper on securing this important debate today. And I was listening to her um, speech, and she was listing the, the ways in which we can uh, prevent cancer or, or protect ourselves against cancer by not smoking, cutting down on drinking, uh, losing weight, and taking more exercise. I was contemplating that as a non-smoking teetotaler who's managed to lose three stone in the last year and is currently in training for two marathons this year that appear to be ticking plenty of the boxes. But yesterday, World Cancer Day, was a, a very poignant day for myself and my family, uh, presiding officer, because the 4th of February 2019 marked the second anniversary of my father's death. Um, and I've mentioned it in a, a question to the minister in the chamber. I want to say a little bit more about the circumstances of my dad's cancer. Neil Finlay quite rightly said that this is an opportunity for us to tell our stories. And I think that my father's story has a very important message attached to it, which I think it benefits for, for me to, to relate. Uh, my dad worked a large part of the year uh, in Africa. He had a business interest in Ghana. And just prior to leaving to return to Africa, he noticed uh, under his false teeth uh, at the base of his mouth uh, what he thought was an ulcer. Um, but being that he had false teeth, he assumed and, and, and tended not to visit the dentists who didn't have regular oral health checkups. And I think it's often a misconception for many that if you don't have your own teeth, that sometimes you don't need to go to the dentist. But I think uh, 
Anna Sarwar has, has left the chamber, but as the resident dentist in, in Holyrood, but I'm sure attest to the fact that dental checks are about much more than just checking that your teeth are okay. It's about your wider oral health. So he dismissed it and, and went off to Africa. And he was due to come back for the period that would span his 60th birthday and we were going to have a big party and a big celebration. And he arrived back with uh, a very large growth uh, on his jaw, which he had um, initially dismissed as probably the result of an insect bite and his, and his face reacting as a consequence to that. Um, but after a period of time and some uh, nagging from my mother, he eventually made an appointment to go and see uh, the emergency dentist, from which he was very quickly referred to the maxillofacial clinic, uh, from where he was referred for a biopsy. Uh, and it was during this pre process that, you know, I began to join the dots and realise that we were probably heading towards uh, the destination of a, a cancer diagnosis. But you read so much in the news about cancers being caught early, people being effectively treated and recovering. And we've heard some fantastic and inspiring stories uh, about people's recovery journeys this evening. Um, but it was uh, in June of 2016 that my father received the diagnosis of cancer and was told that the cancer had uh, developed to a stage that there was no hope for uh, recovery. And um, Neil Findlay mentioned the, the point about, you know, the effect that cancer had uh, in relation to his father and it was an exceptionally difficult period to watch uh, my own father, a man who was always making jokes, always making people laugh and himself had uh, the most infectious laugh, slowly losing the ability to communicate, slowly losing the ability to speak and be understood and the frustration that that gave him as well when he would try to make conversation but couldn't be readily understood because of the effect that oral cancer was having on him. And uh, I mentioned to the minister when I raised uh, a point in the chamber around oral cancer that the last year, uh, sorry, in 2017, uh, the year that my father passed away, the number of oral cancer deaths in NHS Grampian actually rose from 21 to 28. And a point that NHS Grampian officials made to me was that late presentation is often a key factor in relation to that. And I often think back about what if you know, what if my dad had gone and got seen too quicker? What if he'd had regular dental checkups? What if he'd taken the steps that could have perhaps identified that cancer earlier? Would he still be here today with us, laughing, joking, playing with his grandchildren, enjoying time with his family and friends? We don't know for definite, but it would certainly have increased his chances. So I think one of the key messages that, that I wanted to send and have tried to send um, since uh, my father's passing, in particular during the recent Mouth Cancer Awareness Month, was making sure that people understand that even if they think it's nothing, to go and get something checked if they notice anything unusual. Because the people are there who are qualified to tell you it's nothing. But if it's something, it's better to know and it's better to get it de dealt with. Because if you leave it until later, often that can mean leaving it until it's too late. Claire Adamson, followed by Tom Mason. Hey. Thank you, presiding officer, and can I thank Emma Harper for bringing this um, debate to the chamber this evening. I'm feeling a tad emotional. Um, lots of people have shared personal experiences this evening. My that dad died of cancer, so I found Mark McDonald's contribution um, particularly moving. And I do thank um, Neil Fenley and the others who have shared the experience this evening. It's a very brief thing to do. Um, I wanted to start this evening by thanking my um, friend and colleague Hannah Bardell, MP, um, who recently had her own um, uh, smear test recall to the hospital and, and the worry surrounding that. Um, Hannah has campaigned tirelessly for years for the Michelle Henderson Cervical Cancer Trust. Um, Michelle was a young woman in her constituency, a friend of Hannah's who died in her 20s from cervical cancer. And uh, Hannah has used her recent experience to remind young women, in particular, how important it is that when we are offered screening, any of us, how important it is that we take up those offers. Because I know, particularly for young women, that rate of um, taking up those opportunities has fallen recently. And it's just so very important that with all the work that has been done to help people, that people take up those opportunities so that we can prevent 
cancers from developing. Um, uh, Emma mentioned that I have a particular interest in pancreatic cancer. That's indeed come to me through the Begley family from Lanarkshire, who shared their own experience with their, their father with me. And um, my colleague, Nikki McManus, who works for me, Nikki's mum died from pancreatic cancer. And I, I know that's a loss that she and her three children still feel very, very deeply. I was not very aware of the issues around pancreatic cancer. And I think what, what we've heard today is that everybody's individual journey with cancer is unique to them, but we do have trends and uh, statistics we can talk about. And I'm, I'm going to move on to some of those at the moment. Um, when I had the pancreatic cancer event last year, um, there was only one survivor in the room who had lived for more than 10 years. And it's, it's a stark reality of this particular type of cancer that the statistics have hardly changed in the last 50 years. There's great work going on to try and reverse that trend. And I was delighted to meet the young leaders from the Precision Prank Research Team at the Beeston Institute for Cancer Research. Um, the Precision Prank Programme is funded by Cancer Research UK. And we thank them for all they have done to, to promote today and to send us the briefings for this debate. Um, it's also funded by the Scottish Government and it seeks to make those vital breakthroughs that are so important for can ca pancreatic cancer research. Is it unique? Well, eh, it's a cancer where the five-year survival rate for Scotland is only 5.6%. That has increased only by 2.1 percentage points in the last 20 years. And in 2016, 784 people were diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in Scotland and 719 people died. It's got an incredible attrition rate. It's a cancer that is quick. It, it's the rapidity of it is staggering and it, it's one that we really do have to make some of those vital breakthroughs and, and while we celebrate every success and everything that's happening and every survival and um, we do have to recognise that in this particular case there is much more to do. So I thank Pancreatic Cancer UK for the work they are doing. They have a, a, um, a um, petition at the moment to try and um, get the UK and the Scottish Government to increase the treatment rates for cancer. And what they ask is that this particular cancer is treated as an oncological emergency to ensure that people get treatment vitally needed um, more quickly. So I'm going to leave it there, presiding officer, but I just say um, it's been a particularly good um, an informative debate this evening and I do thank everyone because as has been said already this is someone that touches each and every one of us in our lives. Tom Mason followed by Gillian Martin. Uh, thank you presiding officer. It is a great privilege to speak in this debate having done so at this time last year. I'm grateful to Emma Harper for bringing this motion forward for us to discuss. The subject of today's debate is one which will close to the hearts of many members, perhaps through experiences with constituents, friends, or family members. Improving outcomes for people with cancer is a goal we all share across any political divide we normally have. And this is why I'm pleased to mark World Cancer Day and welcome the important progress that has been made in recent years and decades. As the motion notes, there has been marked change in survival rates over the last 40 years. And this is in part to the advances in medical treatment and technology, as well as a change in how we recognize the lifestyle factors that lead to cancer. In many cases, the changes needed to prevent cancer are fairly simple, eating healthily, for example. Some are more challenging, such as with smoking, but when making the change can sometimes be different, make a difference between life and death. We cannot overstate its importance. However, as we look at the good progress and work being done, it is important to consider where we could do, be doing better. One of the key markers here is the Scottish Government's own 95% target for 62-day standard from referral to treatment. According to the latest statistics, only two health boards have managed to meet this, with the NHS gramping in my region coming in at just 76.6%. NHS gramping also falls behind with a target for treatment within, for, for, within 30 days of decision to treat at 90.5% versus a 95% target. Even looking at Scotland more generally, the national average for treatment within 60 days of referral in the last published quarter 
fell from 84.6% to 81.4%. Set against 95% targets, these figures are simply not good enough. There comes a point where good will and good wishes don't cut it. We must see improvement and we need to do it fast. Personally, I feel there is another consideration, the quality of life for cancer survivors. There has been no doubt, even when successful treatment, cancer treatment frequently has long-term side effects. And this, this can cause substantial physical and psychological damage. Having been on the receiving end of myself, I think more attention could be paid to making sure that patients receiving treatment can live their lives as comfortably as possible. And I would welcome any work that can be done in this regard. Presiding officer, no one doubts that this is a vital issue and one that should command our full attention. Important work is being done and that should continue, but there are areas where improvement is needed. By 2027, it is estimated that around 40,000 cases of cancer will be discovered in Scotland every year. It is vital we transform services to deliver better, more supportive care, as well as, as use of resources wisely. So I welcome this debate and hope that we can make the changes we need to make, a, make sure progress over the next 40 years exceeds that which we have come to be used to in the past. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the last two contributions are from Gillian Martin, followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, President Officer. I want to thank my friend Emma Harper for bringing this debate to the Chamber for her online story with her lovely sister Buffy uh, to raise awareness and to the constituents affected by cancer who've got in touch with me asking me to take part in today's debate. And there's so many aspects we can cover in a debate like this, uh, but I want to concentrate on the third sector, one of the third sector agencies in my area who work with those with a cancer diagnosis and their families, that's CLAN. A few months ago, I spent some time at CLAN in Inverurie with a few people and their families who've used their services. And I want to thank the manager, Fiona Cormack, and her team, and everyone I met for, for making me so welcome. But that phrase, and I realized it when I wrote it, using their services, it just doesn't seem adequate for what people's relationship is with CLAN. In the times that I was there, I met with families who told me how CLAN supported them in all manner of ways whilst their loved ones were seriously ill. And I met cancer patients dealing with the trauma of their diagnosis who needed that pastoral care that can't be so easily provided in a healthcare setting and sometimes isn't appropriate to be delivered in a healthcare setting. I met people who'd lost loving ones to cancer and visited the centre for months and years on from that point for emotional and practical support. So what is CLAN and what does it do? Well, what doesn't it do would be easier to cover. CLAN does what it can to fulfil whatever a person needs, whatever they come and ask them to help them with. I mean, that could be advice and support, advice on finances, just simple friendship, community, opportunities to share experiences with others with cancer diagnosis and no shortage of listening ears. They provide complementary therapies too, that sort of thing that can give a person a bit of respite from medical procedures and the stress of their condition, like massage and aromatherapy. And our centre has, has got therapy rooms in it, which are just outstanding. And they've also got support groups for particular groups, and one uh, they've got for children, and one they've got for teenagers affected by cancer. One group I met at the centre, uh, so it was a men's group, and they were just back from a walk, and they meet up once a week for a walk, then a cup of tea and a chat about anything. Uh, they were discussing music when I butted in, and two of them also took the opportunity to give me some casework, which has got nothing to do with their health whatsoever. They're just there for friendship and support. So the friendship group happened to be made up of a range of people affected by cancer. Those currently dealing with a diagnosis and treatment, those in recovery from cancer, and there were a couple of people whose connection to clan and the group was through a family member. One regular visitor was the, the widow of a woman who died over a year ago, who pops in regularly for a chat with the friends that he's made there. And hospitals can't provide that sort of thing. That's why the third sector organisations like clan are needed. And CLAN also operates in the north of my constituency in Turriff and uh, they have to meet in the local library. They don't have a fantastic facility like in Veruri. And I pass off and cross there as I do a constituency surgery there. Um, but they, 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 they might not have the facilities that Inverurie had, but they offered the same support. Um, and like Inverurie, they, they have monthly coffee mornings for people to, to meet and catch up. 
There's no manual on how to cope with a, di a diagnosis of cancer. There's not one for the person receiving the diagnosis, and there's not one for their family and friends. When I spoke to the many people that I met at Clan, one thing came up time and time again, and that was the relief that they say they felt that they had found Clan when they needed them. And there was a reflection on what they would have done if they hadn't found Clan and they hadn't had them to turn to for support. And it struck me that every person who found out about what they do, there will be others out there who need them but haven't found them yet. And that's why I wanted to make them the focus of my contribution today. I want everyone in my area to know that Clan is there. And you might, not be, you might be fortunate enough never to have to walk through their door, but thank goodness they're there for the people who do. Presiding Officer. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm also grateful to Emma Harper for bringing forward a motion and giving us the opportunity to, to come together to mark World Cancer Day. Um, I know that the, 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 the motion talks about the unity band, and I think we actually have seen the, the Parliament unite this evening because we are all touched by cancer, and we've heard a mixture of, of sad stories of people who have lost loved ones, but also hopeful stories like Emma's, uh, Emma Harper's sister, Buffy, Alison Johnson's mum, who hopefully is doing well. And I know that my own mum, who's had her own cancer journey um, recently um, and is, is going back to, to work tomorrow after a, a, an operation a few months ago. So um, often people think that politicians are, are out of touch and we don't understand the issue. But I think we could have all taken part tonight without any briefings. But of course, we are all grateful to uh, Macmillan and Cancer Research UK and Breast Cancer Now for their very helpful briefings and of course for the brilliant jobs that they do supporting families affected by cancer and for their tireless campaigning and, and fundraising and like others I want to pay tribute and say again a personal thank you to our wonderful NHS staff who support people and, and their families through this difficult illness. I know that in the last two years that my family certainly had our, our money's worth out of the NHS and probably um, a bit more. The word cancer used to be a really taboo subject and it carried a lot of stigma and families didn't talk about it and I'm glad that that is changing. We also know that survival rates are improving and we've seen positive campaigns to help break the stigma such as Breast Cancer Now's Wear It Pink campaign which has a lot of fun and George Trust's work um, encouraging women to go for smear tests and I was grateful to colleagues who took part in, in my members debate last month to mark uh, Cervical Cancer Awareness Week. Um, groundbreaking cancer research wouldn't be possible without the incredible fundraising efforts of, of people in our communities. I see it in my own region um, and even just last week I picked up the local paper, the Hamilton Advertiser and the Hamilton Bowling Club ladies section had raised £3,000 for Cancer Research UK. So that generosity happens day in day out. Um, others have talked about um, the third sector and volunteering and, and I was pleased to hear Miles Briggs mention um, transport, I know in my own mum's situation, um, the Lanarkshire Cancer Care Trust was invaluable to her. She didn't want to be relying on family to fit in with her appointments, but she was able to, to make a donation to, to the, the, the volunteer group. But um, she started to affectionately call it the cancer bus because the other people on the, the bus had the same experiences or, or could understand what she was going through and the driver was an expert in terms of getting through the traffic and getting to the right department because she was going to the beats and she was going to hear Myers and other places so again even when you do have a family to come home to as Neil Findlay was touching on quite often it's not your family you want to open up to so I know for my mum that was um, a really um, important um, experience um, <coughs> And, and Lanarkshire, again, trying to remain positive, um, I'm pleased that, that recent stats show that the majority of patients have been treated um, within treatment time standards, but we know in terms of diagnostics, that's not the experience nationally. So perhaps when the minister is closing, he can give the chamber a bit of an update. I know, again, the cross-party group on cancer has been doing some really good work here. So I think we all want to keep improving and, and support um, each other. Um, others have touched on the fact that there's a lot we can do to prevent cancer. And I think we really have to, to focus on that. But again, we have to make sure that when we have um, strategies and, and policies that we have to make sure that um, it's realistic and it's easy for people to make sometimes the lifestyle changes um, and look at the barriers people face in order to make 
the right choices, the healthier choices. Um, we've seen a great amount of progress. We know in this parliament we can do tremendous things like the smoking ban. My own gran, who I loved very much and missed dearly after 16 years, was a heavy smoker, but she was a barmaid and she worked in smoke filled working men's clubs and pubs and, and she died of, of lung cancer. Um, I remember every day through my daughter who's now called after her, Isabella, but these are the kind of things that hopefully we're going to see less of and I thank everyone for their, their contributions. Can I now ask Joe Fitzpatrick to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, um, and thank you, Emma Harper, for securing this important debate. I'm pleased to join Emma and others in the Chamber in wearing my unity band. Um, today's debate and, um, provides us with the opportunity to reflect upon the preventable causes of cancer and the steps all of us can take to reduce the impact of this terrible disease. It's fitting that we should have this debate um, today following World Cancer Day yesterday. This day is intended to target misinformation, raise awareness and tackle the stigma so often associated with can cancer. Day is important for those who are currently affected by cancer in, re in reducing the number of people who develop cancer in the first place, in detecting cancer at the earliest possible stages and in supporting those who have a cancer di diagnosis, their families um, and friends. Um, I was really pleased yesterday to be able to mark um, Cancer Day by visiting Maggie's in Edinburgh. My paths crossed with uh, Miles and, and like Miles uh, Briggs, um, I really appreciated the time that people took to, to speak to, to us ar around the kitchen table. And <clears throat> Maggie's is, is one example of some of the many organisations who do some fantastic work. Um, Julie Martin mentioned Clan and others mentioned um, Macmillan nurses and there are so many organizations doing so so much good work and I thank them all um, I was also very pleased to be able to speak at the Scottish Cancer Prevention Conference yes, Network co Conference yesterday this is an important uh, gathering of world experts on cancer prevention who are largely based here in Scotland we can <clears throat> be proud that our NHS and academic institutions are working together on highlighting and helping everyone in Scotland to live healthier lives that conference highlighted projects like Act Well, led by Professor Annie Anderson from Dundee University, encouraging women across Scotland who attend breast screening programmes to reduce their risk of developing breast cancer by taking up physical activity, mentioned by Alison Johnson, to, um, eating healthy and losing weight. Um, it's delivered in partnership with Breast Cancer Now volunteers and supported by the Scottish Government. This project is making a real difference to women across Scotland, including in my own constituency. Presiding officer, let me assure everyone here in the chamber that the Scottish Government is determined to play its part in tackling cancer. Current projections from Cancer Research UK tell us that one in two people in the UK born after 1960 will be affected by cancer. We need to reduce these figures over time and to ensure that the right support is in place to help those affected by cancer. Significant progress has um, been made over the last 10 years with the overall cancer mortality rate uh, falling by 11%. However, more needs to be done to reduce the risk factors associated with cancer. Our £100 million cancer strategy, Beating Cancer, Ambition and Action, sets out our ambition for the future of cancer services in Scotland, improving the prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment and aftercare of those affected by all forms of cancer. And one of, one of the areas, of course, is, is research. It's an area where Scotland is to the fore. Um, Claire Adamson mentioned the position Precision Pank project and the Scottish Government has committed some £4 million to Precision Medicine ecosystem including £700,000 direct to the Precision Pank um, project. So that's, that's a project which I think can potentially make a real difference to ensure that cancer treatment, particularly for, for pancreatic cancers but others as well, um, are based on the genetics of the individual patient's tumour. So there's a real progress potential there. It's also important that we make sure that the, 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 the whole journey um, is, um, 
as positive a, as it can be. And so that's why the cancer patient survey mentioned by Miles Briggs was so important. And I'm pleased to be able to say that we've just concluded the, the, the cancer patient surgery. It closed um, in December of last year, and we're expecting to publish the results from that in the spring of next year. And we'll, reduce, we'll use the results of that to identify gaps in services so that we can focus on addressing those um, going forward. Um, Gillian Martin also mentioned um, the holistic support um, for people with, um, with cancer, and I think that that's a, a very important point, and it's one that is specifically um, within our cancer strategy, and uh, hopefully the, the, the um, cancer patient survey will help us make sure that we are, we are getting that right and making sure that people are getting the, 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 the support that they need, and um, organisations like CLAN are, are very useful in helping us achieve that support. Um, as Emma Harper said, it's estimated that four in 10 cancer cases can be prevented, and that can largely be done through lifestyle changes, such as not smoking, maintaining a healthy body weight, eating um, a healthy and balanced diet, reducing alcohol intake, protecting our skin from sunburn, and by keeping, keeping active. Neil Finlay rightly made the point um, that we have a higher mortality rate in Scotland's most deprived communities. And that's why in each of our strategies, which I'll, I'll try and touch on some of them, we specifically, um, in terms of tackling smoking, healthy eating, drinking alcohol, we specifically have a focus on, 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 on um, tackling that health inequality. And I'll talk later, hopefully, if I have time, about some of the success that we've, 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 we've had in that. Um, so what, one, one of the, the first areas where I think we have seen success is in relation to um, smoking. So we've um, had particular success um, across Scotland, where we now have just one in five adults in Scotland smoking, um, and the number of 15-year-olds who smoke regularly has dropped uh, by more than two-thirds in the last decade. But it is, it is clear that um, there is still more smoking is still more prevalent in the more deprived areas, but we are now starting to see uh, success in, in, in reducing those levels there. Emma Harper asked whether we, um, about the um, stop smoking services, and I can assure you there's no intention to reduce those, um, those services. There's £10 million provided annually to health boards. And I, I think that is particularly important as we it perhaps are now getting to the point where people need more support who've not already given up smoking and, and, and much of that within the most deprived areas. Um, as we've heard, obesity is the second largest preventable cause of cancer, um, according to Cancer Research UK, and linked to some 2,200 cases of cancer in Scotland. That's why it's really important that we make progress um, in, in, in in, in reducing uh, diet-related health inequalities. So one of the first things that I did as Public Health Minister was to launch a diet and healthy weight delivery plan, tackling the issues through um, a focus on prevention. One of the areas we know we have to, to work together on is in, in relation to foods which are high in fat, salt and sugars. So our consultation has just closed, um, asking about uh, restriction on uh, multi-buy uh, promotions, uh, placements at checkouts and uh, product promotions. These are, this, is, this will be, um, I think, a really important area that this parliament, I think, can, can help our population see, um, it make, make, make it easier for the population to make better health choices. Um, but I think it will be one that we have to work together on going forward. Um, a number of members asked about um, screening and, and early detection. And we, we know that if, if people, um, if cancer is detected earlier, then, then that then leads to a better um, prognosis going forward. And our, our national cancer screening programs continue to work um, towards identifying bowel, breast, and cervical cancer at the earliest stages. Um, and um, Alison Johnson and Neil Finlay both mentioned, and, and rightly so, that um, levels of um, uptake of screening is lower, again, in, in those areas of um, deprivation. So I want to talk, particularly, time is, is tight, so I'll talk about one of those um, areas of screening, which is the bowel um, uh, screening test, where Scotland was one of the first to introduce 
the, the, the simpler bills test, the, the FIT test, um, in November of 2017. And we've now seen increasing levels of participation in the bowel screening. So the statistics published just today show that we've now exceeded the 60% target for uptake for the first time. But, um, and that is really, really important. And, but one of the, the most important things within that is that the biggest improvement has been amongst those living in the most deprived areas where we've seen a 10% increase in, um, that in, in, in those areas of, of deprivation. And so that's, that's really important. Um, so I think somebody made the point that, you know, if, if, if you're encouraged to get a test, if you're um, given, um, if you've got one of these bowel tests at home sitting in the drawer or one's going to come through in the weeks coming, please take the time to complete it and post it, post it in because it could save your life. Um, Monica Lennon asked about diagnosis, di diagnostics, and we're continuing to look at how we can uh, make improvements there. One of the areas we're particularly looking at is the development of rapid um, diagnosis and treatment centres, which are currently being piloted in England, and a final um, report on that pilot work is due to be published later this year, and our Scottish Cancer Task Force will um, consider the results of that um, to learn where we can use that to improve our services here. Um, presenting officer, um, in, in coming to a close, I, I want to take the opportunity to thank all of the staff, volunteers, um, who work tirelessly in our NHS and the, uh, the charity sector to help to deliver our strategies for cancer in prevention, diagnosis, treatment and support for those with a, ca a cancer diagnosis. Their unending commitment is invaluable in driving back this disease. In final conclusion, a, a huge thanks to Emma Harper for lodging this important debate and also for her and many others for sharing their personal stories, which I think is, is really important in a debate like today. So thank you all very, very much. That finally, finally concludes the debate <laughs> and this meeting is closed.